Throughout the ages, there have been great empires and civilizations that have risen up, their creators ruling nations, regions and continents for hundreds, even thousands of years. Some of the great legacies and accomplishments of these empires may be lost in the mists of time, but from what they have left behind in rock and ruin, we can trace remarkable stories. China is one of the world's most ancient civilizations, along with the Babylonians, Mayans and Egyptians. There has been official documentation of Chinese history for more than 3,000 years. It is a success story of population movement, economic expansion, technological advancement, all in one. They typically view other people being less civilized to show how civilized they are. So they use outsiders as, as a reference system to actually praise themselves, you know, we're different. We're the people leading civilization. China has a long and rich history stretching back several millennia with most of its many dynasties each holding power for several hundred years. This idea of the narrative of sort of 5,000 years of unbroken history, this is a very successful narrative that has been crafted. This ancient land is crossed by 50,000 rivers, including the Great Yangtze and Yellow Rivers. Traces of a 60,000-year-old so-called Peking man and other Neolithic humans have been found in these giant fertile river basins, which is where Chinese civilization began. There is evidence grain was being harvested here up to 10,000 years ago. This vast land expanse also includes rugged plateaus, foothills and mountains, which occupy nearly two thirds of the country, higher in the west and lower in the east, like a three-step ladder. China was the first literate culture east of Mesopotamia. Reminiscent of the hieroglyphics of ancient Egypt, Chinese is the origin of the only pictographic writing system. The Chinese language was developed using images. Many of the Chinese characters we use today come from ancient drawings of the items they were meant to describe. A common example is the word for mountain, Shan. The three points of the character are meant to resemble the three peaks of a mountain ridge. It is rare in being one of the only languages left that is purely graphic. One of its great advantages is that it unifies different speech groups and different languages, in fact, because they can all read that script. Isolated geographically from the Mediterranean in Europe, and with no great powers on its doorstep, its development was unique and underwritten by an administrative class that adhered to Confucian values and continuity. There's this very powerful sense of what is Chinese culture. These ideas of sort of order, hierarchy, a lot of different styles that you could say were distinctively Chinese in terms of art, literature. So there's been strong identity around these things that is distinctive. Confucianism, Taoism and Buddhism are regarded as the three teachings underlying the foundations of Chinese culture. And it's your combination of creatures which may be clash, which is bad for your fate, or in harmony, which is good for your fate, it tells you your fate. Officially, China has 56 ethnic groups. Most minority groups have their own distinctive culture. Some also have their own language and writing system. Today, China is the world's third largest country after Canada and Russia, bordered by 14 countries. It has been the world's fastest growing economy for the last 30 years and is now the world's second largest. It's known as the factory of the world and is today the planet's biggest producer of many things, 
including concrete, steel, fertilizer, clothing and toys. Every nation has a story of itself, and I think China's story of the 5,000 years of unbroken culture is very powerful. There's the strength in it being unbroken, whereas the reality is always so much more messy and complicated. We have invasions, we have ruptures, we have crises, and these are perhaps glossed over instead by this kind of reference to a long-standing ancient culture. Over the millennia, the Chinese capital has moved from Xi'an to Nanjing to Beijing. But thousands of years ago, it was located in a remote city on its western borders. In 2002, workers excavating an underground car park unearthed what was to become one of the most startling recent finds from the ancient world. They discovered the remains of several ancient wooden chariots, together with the bones of horses which had been buried with them. The finds were almost 3,000 years old, part of a burial chamber from China's first imperial dynasty, the Shu dynasty which ruled for more than eight centuries, longer even than the Roman Empire, which was to follow centuries later. Throughout the history of China, it's been subject to invasion, um, as are all agrarian states, um, by their pastoralist or nomadic neighbors. The invasion of China by these horse-riding pastoralists, who are extremely swift, the Chinese began to trade with the Xiongnu um, and part of that trade was for their horses so that the Chinese could be a horse, uh, could have their own cavalry and horse-drawn chariots. The number of horses indicated the rank and identity of the nobles. The Shu emperors had six horses to drive their chariots. Like a number of China's imperial dynasties to follow, the Zhu had come from the outlying regions of today's China, in this case, the steppes of Central Asia. But they were the first to establish the idea that the emperor had a mandate from heaven. The emperor, in fact, was the son of heaven. So one of the great mysteries of Chinese dynastic history is why wasn't there a unified religion? When you think of European history, you know, you usually think of the growth of Christianity and how it prevailed uh, against other religions like Islam and then very early on, I suppose, Judaism. You know, why was it that you kind of had no, none of this in Chinese history? Um, and I think, you know, one of the answers was that the, the kind of cult of this semi-divine figure, like an emperor, that they weren't called an emperor in the very early dynasties, is the answer, you know, that these were people who almost transferred to the other world. In the earliest dynasties, 3,000 years ago, these figures are presented as quasi-divine, and that didn't stop when more modern history began. I mean, they continued with these extraordinary powers. After the Zhu dynasty fell, China entered what became known as the Warring States period, an era of dynastic and tribal division which would break out periodically over the next thousand years. But what would remain more or less constant throughout, whichever dynasty would be in power, was an adherence to the principles and values espoused by one man, Confucius. Confucius lived from 551 to 479 BC and was a Chinese philosopher and politician who was traditionally considered the paragon of Chinese sages one of the most important and influential individuals in human history. His teaching and philosophy remains influential to this day. It emphasizes personal and governmental morality, correctness of social relationships, justice, kindness, and sincerity. Some people think of Confucianism as a religion. In fact, it never really was. It was a moral philosophy, and it had people who were experts in its texts, scholars. What Confucianism educates 
is a way with words. Good writing, as well as good speech, and ways of mediating between people. Confucius is renowned for his famous sayings. Never do to another what you would not want done to you. Roads were made for journeys, not destinations. The strength of a nation derives from the integrity of the home. The man who moves a mountain begins with carrying away small stones. Followers of Confucius have erected thousands of temples to venerate the great sage over the past 2,500 years, right up to the modern day. Traditional Chinese temples and civic buildings, such as Confucian temples, are built on a heavy platform with a large roof that floats over the base. Load-bearing wooden pillars that are not planted into the foundations make the buildings resilient to earthquakes and storms and allow for easier reconstruction if the buildings are damaged. These support heavy ceramic tiled roofs with wide eaves and slightly upturned corners. Important to protect the building from weathering since wood rots much faster when it's wet. The wide eaves also provide shade in the summer and in the winter allow more light to enter the windows. Traditional Chinese architecture stresses the visual impact of the width of the buildings and their symmetry. With Feng Shui and other cosmological considerations also important, these structural principles have remained largely unchanged over the millennia, retaining a focus on enclosed open spaces. Architects in ancient China paid special attention to colour and adornments, from the whole building to specific parts. Buildings were often quite colourful with carved beams and painted rafters and roof tiles. Confucius would lay the fabric of a Chinese society for centuries to come, but it was 200 years after his death that another dynasty took hold, the first to unite the country and give it its name. His name was Qin Sui Huang, and he would be known as the first emperor of China. Emerging from the Warring States period, incredibly, Qin's rule only lasted 15 years. Admired by Mao Zedong, in that short time, this autocrat raised vast armies and left behind this incredible monument. The Terracotta Army is a collection of terracotta sculptures depicting his armies buried with the Emperor Qing, with the purpose of protecting the emperor in his afterlife. The figures were only discovered in 1974 by local farmers. When you look at the terracotta warriors and, and the, you know, this figure whose tomb was so vast that it's still not being excavated today, you know, it's huge. It goes on for acres and acres. And you kind of think this, this is not something for a human, this is something for like a god. And I think that's really kind of representative of this idea that the emperor was a person between heaven and earth. This terracotta army contains more than 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots with 520 horses and 150 cavalry horses the majority of which remained buried in the pits near Qin Shi Huang's mausoleum. They vary in height according to their roles, with the tallest being the generals. The different ethnicities of the warriors can be seen, underscoring the multicultural, racial nature of ancient China. Other terracotta non-military figures were found in other pits, including acrobats, strongmen and musicians. It's thought up to 700,000 workers were needed to build the mausoleum, and many did not survive. The mausoleum itself is unopened. Emperor Qin inspired great loyalty among his peasant army by paying them with land. So you have actually free citizens holding properties, and they don't really sort of serve any masters. Uh, they are their own masters, their own lives. So this is something very different. So we call the Chinese empire a bureaucratic monarchy rather than you know, any kind of monarchy, right? 
so it is certainly not feudal. Um, the equivalent in Europe will be Napoleon's France. This is a model China operated ever since 221 BC. So I think this is the longest lasting free peasantry economy in the world. This alliance then became the peasant state alliance. By the time of China's next dynasty, the Han, China had a population of 120 million, twice that of the Roman Empire, which was in power at the same time. They were the center of the universe. They would see themselves as the uh, civilized world, what would be beyond the boundaries of either the Han Empire or the Roman Empire or the land of the barbarians. And the further away they were, the more barbaric they would be. And they were also um, comparable in terms of their effectiveness in their control. I think the uh, idea that they were strong empires primarily because they have strong military is slightly misleading. Yes, they certainly did have strong military, but it's much more the man managerial and logistical capacity which define them as empires. And of course, they trade with others. They engage with the uh, barbarian states regularly, um, but they always maintain their superiority and they always project that if you were to stand up against the Han Empire or the Roman Empire, the empire would come and get you at some stage. And when that moment comes, expect no mercy. You will either become civilized or you'll be crushed. Laws operated. Capital punishment was beheading. Spies and traitors were sawn in half at the hip. Much of the ancient world produced gruesome torture methods, and the Chinese were no exception. There are Chinese documents that do mention the Roman Empire at that time, which is obviously in existence. But there's no real mention of China in classical kind of Roman Empire documents, Latin documents. Uh, I mean, I think a couple of very indirect references, but, you know, there was a sort of asymmetry right from the beginning that it seems that people in the territory that's today China had an awareness of a world beyond their, you know, kind of horizons, whereas it wasn't really reciprocated. And I think that's been a pattern throughout the last 20 centuries. Trade was established along the Silk Route between these two great empires. The first garrisons in the West, in the Han Dynasty, went as far as what we now call as the, the Western Territory, the Xinjiang, where the Uyghurs live. The idea of being invaded was part of the way in which the Chinese state worked, that it had to deal with potential invaders by trading with them, by intermarrying with them, by giving them gifts, by inviting them as tributaries so that there was an exchange of gifts. That happened all the way through for all the dynasties. The Han ruled for 400 years from 202 BC to 220 AD. And this period is considered a golden age in Chinese history and influenced the identity of the Chinese civilization ever since. Once you had an imperial centralized empire, then you have a centralized bureaucracy. And that was the point when Confucianism was being introduced into the Han Empire as a kind of, if you like, pre-modern state ideology to provide the kind of uh, moral authorities to the emperor to control. And the control is exercised not only through its managerial and logistical capacity and the threat of punishment, but it's also controlled through the spread of this idea 
the idea of what is right and what is wrong, and how you, as a government official, needs to respond to the emperor. The bureaucracy became famous in Europe. It was said to be open to anyone with merit. So that whole notion of a meritocracy, that we have succeeded to make into a kind of ideology in this country, was modeled on the Chinese examination system for its imperial administration. It's one of the Chinese inventions. Modern China's majority ethnic group refers to themselves as the Han Chinese. Their language is known as Han language, and the written Chinese is referred to as Han characters. The Han developed a cult of agriculture. Peasants were given names, which they did not have at the time. A quarter of Chinese names today come from this period. The Han invented the crossbow, which barbarian tribes did not have as they couldn't cast the bronze locks required. If you go to Silk Road, you see Chinese traditional paper making actually is still alive there. Even we in China, we do not do the same thing anymore. Paper making involved a boiled mixture of mulberry tree bark, hemp, old linens, and fishnets, which created a pulp that was pounded into paste and stirred with water. Mm -hmm. A wooden framed sieve with a mat of sewn reeds was dunked into the mixture, which was then shaken and dried into sheets of paper that were bleached under the exposure of sunlight. This process was gradually improved through leaching, polishing and glazing to produce a smooth, strong paper. When the Han Dynasty fell around 250 AD, China once again divided into rival kingdoms. This time for another 400 years, during a period known as the Three Kingdoms. In the first 1,300 years of its history, the country had only been united for about four centuries. It was in the latter stages of the Han Empire that Buddhism arrived with Indian missionaries. Buddhism is China's oldest foreign religion and it merged with the local religion, Taoism, which expounded a philosophical system guiding human behavior in accordance with alternating cycles of nature. Together, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism constituted the three teachings that have shaped Chinese culture ever since. Taoism, like the classical Confucian texts, is a system of self-cultivation. For Confucian, it's a self-cultivation for everyday life. For Taoism, it's an ascetic discipline, that's a bodily discipline, to reach immortality for your own body. Um, whereas the Confucian system is a system of immortality for your descent line through, the, through males. So the hope is that, 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 that the descent line will go on into eternity. And from Taoism's point of view, the hope is that your body will become a celestial bureaucrat. That is to say, you'll get a position in the celestial realm and that your body will be preserved in its grave, intact. The Chinese prefer to learn about philosophy instead of religion. They take what they think will help them and reject what they think is unnecessary. This has led to a huge number of protector gods and cults, which have millions of followers. Here in Fujian, on the east coast, a huge festival is held for Mazu, the goddess of the sea. This spectacular festival tells the story of Mazu's battles against typhoons and sea monsters. It also depicts the fight between two great generals for her love, as tales of her powers grew. 
Chinese emperors sanctioned cults and religions too. But the emperor of China's next dynasty would also become the country's first Buddhist emperor. Despite the teachings of Buddhism, Emperor Wen had a reputation for violence, but he was also ruthlessly efficient. As a meritocrat, he saw how nepotism had destroyed the Han dynasty. The Shui can take credit for much of the early construction of this, the Grand Canal, today a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and still the longest as well as the oldest canal or artificial river in the world. The oldest parts of the canal date back to the 5th century BC, but various sections were first connected during just 40 years of the Shui dynasty at the end of the 6th century. Five million laborers watched over by 50,000 guards connected Beijing with the breadbaskets of southern China. The canal helped unify and govern the country. Its giant rivers flowed west to east, but the canal was north-south, enabling the distribution of much-needed grain shipments. Divided into seven sections, it would eventually run 1,800 kilometers between Beijing in the north and Hangzhou in the south, linking the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. The whole river transport support 22 cities single-handedly. And they're still there now. And also the waterway is still functioning today. So in that sense, you know, um, the, the, it is a marvel of engineering and also it is a marvel of state resources. We don't really know and how, we don't really know how they did it. Imagine the, the, the labor force you needed even today to build, you know, 3,000 kilometers long canal in, in this country. Over time, the canal was updated and improved by later dynasties, beginning with the country's next great dynasty. It was opened in terms of ideas. It was opened to ideas not only within old China, but also externally from beyond the boundary of the Tang Empire itself. But that was partly because the imperial court of the Tang Dynasty was half Turkic and half Han. They were not a complete Han royal family. So they were always um, readily looking beyond the Chinese borders for ideas and accepting them. They were not Chinese. They were not Han Chinese. There were Turks, basically. Like the Shui who preceded them, the Tang leant towards Buddhism. The court took it up as it had taken up Taoists for alchemical reasons, that is to say, to preserve the body of and the line of, the fertility and line of the emperor. The giant Buddha of Lashan was built at this time. This 71-metre-tall stone statue, built between 713 and 803, is carved out of a cliff face at the confluence of rivers in the southern part of Sichuan province, near the city of Lashan. It is the largest and tallest stone Buddha statue in the world, and by far the world's tallest pre-modern statue. Under the Tang, the Silk Route trade expanded dramatically the Chinese were interested in the famed Central Asian horses and agricultural products, such as apples. Chinese goods, such as silk, ceramics and tea, were highly sought after. And this exchange would lead to a huge single market for luxury goods that ran from Japan to Morocco. It was cosmopolitan. There was a lot of trade. Xi'an, the city of the terracotta warriors, was maybe a million people this period of time, that was a phenomenal number of people. And there's all sorts of evidence of trade routes, which are now famously called the Silk Roads, but there were many different kinds of routes and all sorts of places that the Tang were trading with. The Silk Route was also a cultural highway. 
new philosophical ideas and religions traveled and were exchanged along the Silk Route, as well as new ideas of science, technology, and politics. By the 9th century, the Tang were one of two major world powers, the other being the Muslim Abbasid Empire based in Baghdad. Western Europe was languishing in the Dark Ages, a cultural backwater. Soon, a thriving maritime silk route existed between the two, with Chinese goods such as silk and ceramics being transported via Sumatran, Selenese and Pakistani ports to Basra on the coast of today's Iraq. Shipwrecks containing sought-after Chinese ceramics have been discovered along this route. Europeans could not compete with China in technology for much of recorded history. It took Europe eight centuries to reproduce Chinese porcelain. With the end of the Tang Dynasty in 907, China entered another period of division before 60 years later, the Song Dynasty began building on the achievements of the Tang. The Song were great builders, constructing extravagant palaces, wooden bridges and towering pagodas. Pagodas were originally built in India from Buddhist stupas. As Buddhism became more popular in India, so did the number and height of pagodas. Originally made of wood, a burial place for monks and a home of sacred relics and texts, these multi-storied structures became popular monuments renowned for their spectacular views. Under the Song, the original circular base became hexagonal or octagonal. Pagodas could reach 100 metres in height, and the spire on top was not only meant to make the pagoda look more powerful, but protect the wooden structure from lightning. Still, many burned down, and under the Song, more and more were built in stone and brick. Gunpowder had been developed under the Tang, and during the Song, we see its use in incendiary bombs used in catapults. But for the Song, such inventions would prove powerless against a formidable adversary. China's northern neighbor, the Mongol Empire under Genghis Khan had conquered vast areas of Central Asia, reaching the eastern extremes of Europe. And in 1205, Genghis Khan began staging small raids into Chinese territory. Then, in 1279, the country suffered a brutal invasion on its northern borders by Genghis Khan's son, Kublai Khan. The Song were crushed. This was the first time in history that the whole of China was conquered and subsequently ruled by a foreign or non-native ruler. The Mongol Empire now stretched all the way from the Pacific to the Mediterranean. In China, the Mongols really uh, faced a very stiff resistance for 40 years. That's the longest on the record, right? Now, the Mongol tactic was the following. I give you a notice, and I'll come back in a week or two. You open your city gates, otherwise I kill everything, everything moving. Cats, hands, dogs, human. The language was not Mandarin, was not Chinese. The entire Mongol military and the Mongol administration were run by the Mongols or their uh, mercenaries. They don't allow the Chinese to be part of it. So it's kind of an apartheid system. Kublai Khan's order was to kill Chinese. How many Chinese were killed? We don't really know, but from the census record uh, made by the second emperor of the Mongol rule, the Chinese population declined by over 90%, 90 percent, nine zero. 90 percent Chinese actually vanished. From the previous around 100 million to about 7 million. It's incredible. So I think it, it was a miracle for China to survive as a civilization. The Mongols uh, run a kind of a 
uh, feudal system for their political control, and then they run slavery for their labor market. So it's a, it's a, it's a very alien system, very alien. So then this is the most telling how the Mongols view the Chinese literati. They say the literati is, uh, should be ranked lower than the prostitutes. Think about it. Chinese were forbidden to marry Mongols, speak the language or carry firearms. Marco Polo visited China during this time. Although Chinese scholars dismiss Marco Polo's accounts as being an unreliable portrayal of life in China at this time. On his own account, he worked as a high-powered imperial inspector reporting directly to the throne you know, uh, in South China. And uh, he was really uh, the man uh, uh, to represent uh, the, uh, you know, the Mongol government. Now, uh, we have several doubts about his true identity or his true experience in China. A, he never mentioned chopsticks. B, he never mentioned Chinese writing. C, he never mentioned the Great War of China. And, uh, and so, so forth. So it is seems to us he he may not really uh, physically visit China at all. Uh, but having said that, let's say he was in China, but certainly he mingled with Mongols and his fellow, we call it uh, colored eye race people. Colored eye race people means Europeans and uh, you know, Middle Easterns, Easterners, you know, they have different eye colors uh, from the Chinese, right? So there were the mission, you know, mercenaries working for you know, high-powered places for, for the Mongol rulers. And uh, so you have this, you know, if you understand, you know, if he were in China, uh, then uh, China must run the apartheid to separate him from, from the rest of the population. But the Mongols did make traveling along the Silk Road safer. Marco Polo said he'd found a country that had opened up. Chinese ceramics and porcelain were now especially prized along the Silk Route. The Chinese had found a way to fire pottery to very high temperatures centuries before anyone else. This produced a much harder ceramic. There is evidence that the distinct look of Ming porcelain was influenced by Persian ceramics, making their way along the Silk Route. But the Mongols' bloody occupation wouldn't last. Nanjing today appears as any other modern 21st century city, but in the 15th century, it became China's capital with the coming of the Ming Dynasty, the last dynasty ruled by the Han Chinese. By 1400, it was the largest city in the world with a population of half a million people. The city walls here were 30 miles long, built by 200,000 laborers over a period of 21 years. They are among the longest surviving city walls in China. Although the capital would soon be relocated to Beijing, it remained the southern capital for much of the Ming's 300-year rule. At the heart of Nanjing, they erected an incredible pagoda made of colorful porcelain bricks. This porcelain tower stood for 400 years before being destroyed in the Taiping Rebellion in 1860. A modern version, mirroring its exact dimensions, has been erected in Nanjing today. After the Mongol invasion, the Ming were preoccupied with defense. It was the Ming who rebuilt much of China's most iconic and enduring landmark the Great Wall of China. This remains one of the most impressive physical accomplishments in human history, straddling China's historical northern border, much of it with Mongolia, 
The wall had been built incrementally over 1,500 years as a means of fortification against invading forces, particularly the nomadic tribes of Central Asia. The earliest walls dated back to the 3rd century BC, but during the Ming it was extended to cover a distance of 13,000 miles. By the end, 3,000 fortifications had been built up over a period of 1,700 years. Snaking along through hills, plains, deserts and swamps, with an average height of 25 feet and housing 25,000 watchtowers or beacons along its course, this robust man-made barricade had been started from scratch in the 5th century BC. The walls form a major portion of the entire built structure. They stand to a height ranging between 20 to 30 feet. The width at the base stretches to 21 feet and tapers to 19 feet at the top. High bastions or signal towers were placed 18 kilometers apart from each other and usually located on hilltops. Smoke signals were used to transmit military information and communications by day and fires or beacons were used at night. But along an arc that roughly demarcates Mongolia from China, the Great Wall is the largest ever built structure in terms of mass and surface area. The purpose is not to stop the soldiers from outside China, but their horses. Soldiers can easily overcome the wall with their hands and you know, basically ropes. The horses cannot overcome. So once these you know, enemy soldiers coming in whatever number uh, to China, then they are dis basically disarmed with their most effective weapon of their cavalry. This is a formidable barrier for Mongol cavalry. In 1449, after the Ming army's defeat at the hands of the Mongols, a massive reconstruction of the Great Wall was ordered. Sections closer to Beijing, now the throne of the Ming dynasty, were especially reinforced to the point of making them impenetrable by any means. Walls were also built to ensure protection of the silk trade route. As an extension of the Great Wall, and over a period of almost 200 years, the Ming built this fortress at Jiguan on the edge of the Gobi Desert. It marked the western door to China, the extent of Ming imperial power. Facing the heavily invaded Hexi Corridor beyond its gates were a realm of nomads, exiles and hostile tribes. The Ming also re-established the maritime Silk Route. The expeditions of the eunuch admiral Zheng Dei were successful in establishing new trading relationships. Zheng's flagship was the largest ship ever built at the time, being 443 feet long. He made seven expeditions. The last, in 1433, involved 250 ships and 10,000 seamen and took him as far as the East Africa coast. Vasco da Gama reached Kenya 80 years later with only four ships and 170 men. Chinese imperial ambitions by Zheng Dei and others were largely mercantile. Ever since Marco Polo, travelers and traders marveled at these giant Chinese junks that carried the precious porcelain, tea and silk the outside world craved. The Chinese sought exotic goods such as pearls, gems and scented woods and spices in return. All these riches could be found aboard junks plying the waters in the Pearl River Delta in ports like Guangzhou. Its warehouses were the ancient entry and exit ports of the trade. Today, this region is part of the largest urban agglomeration on Earth. For the Ming, an integral part of maritime silk route for the Chinese was the Malaysian port of Malacca. A replica of a giant Chinese junk is a tourist attraction today. But in the 16th century, the adventurous Portuguese sacked it and began building fortifications in other maritime silk route ports. 
opening up a new chapter that would soon change China's relationship with the outside world. Back home, the increasingly isolationist xenophobic Ming had banned all private trade. Henceforth, all trade was controlled by the state and viewed as tribute. This had been a long-standing practice in China involving elaborate rituals whereby the tributary envoy would kowtow before the emperor as a symbolic recognition of their inferiority. Even then, trade was only allowed once every eight years. But under the Ming, private traders were banned from going to sea and meeting foreigners. Thousands who broke this rule were put to death. Secure in the belief of the superiority of their culture, the Ming court retreated behind the giant walls of the Forbidden City in the capital, Beijing. They had built this giant imperial compound covering 120 acres almost three centuries earlier, and it protected them now as it did then from the barbarians beyond the gates. But by the 16th century, the barbarians were coming closer. On the west coast of India, where the Chinese had erected giant fishing nets centuries earlier, the Portuguese now built ports, traded spices and brought their religion as well. The Europeans also brought something which threatened Chinese copper coinage, silver. Because the Chinese produce year in year out a lot of surpluses, but they are perishable. And the Chinese copper coins are not really, you know, um, cannot hold value, put it this way. Yeah. So they, they try very, very hard to find the equivalent of, you know, uh, something which they can use to, to, to basically to restore and keep value and turned out to be, and that thing must be, you know, you have to have endless supply of that. Yeah, so the Chinese start to export tea, porcelain, silk to buy in silver. Silver was not free for China. You have to buy the silver from the Spaniards. Yeah, so imagine 250 years, over one billion pesos coming to China. So the Chinese must have sold equivalent one over one billion pesos worth Chinese surpluses to buy the scene. So they can actually hold it. So the grandfather can pass on to the grandsons. In China, cities such as Pingao had become the financial center of the Ming Empire. It was here that much of the silver was stored and processed. It's estimated that three quarters of the world's silver mined in Spain's Latin American colonies ended up in China. The city walls of Pingao were constructed in 1370, just three years after the coming of the Ming. The walls remain among the best preserved in China. But after 300 years, the days of the Ming Empire were numbered. All dynasties start off being very strong, effective, and centrally controlled and it would decline over the years in terms of its effectiveness and therefore capacity to control the far flung bits of the empire. It had enormous achievements, I mean, particularly the kind of maritime adventures that were conducted in the earlier part of the Ming Dynasty. But towards the last quarter or even a third of the dynasty, it was really very, very corrupt and inefficient and lived in that period of Ming China really wasn't that wonderful for your uh, average person living in that empire. The coming and going of dynasties could always be attributed to the withdrawal of the heavenly mandate. Outside Nanjing today, burial mounds and the Ming tombs contain the remains of 13 of the 16 emperors who ruled China from the 14th to the 17th centuries. Another mighty dynasty would soon replace the Ming, 
But in many respects, these incredible structures remain the enduring image of the magnificence of imperial China. They were designed in accordance with Feng Shui. Bad spirits and evil winds would descend from the north. Thus, the temples were placed in valleys at the base of large mountains. There is no plan to enter the tombs. From the Eurocentric point of view, if we are so strong, so capable, you should take over the world. If you do not take over the world, that means you're weak, right? Black and white. But the Chinese made a conscious choice. We report what we see overseas, but we are not going to settle there. Well, it's not our land. Next time, China would soon be invaded again, this time by another martial tribe on its northern borders. The Manchus from Manchuria would oversee a dynasty that would last much longer than the Mongols. China would soon annex more territory. From these mighty heights, few believed the Qing Empire would become China's last imperial dynasty.